Jim, thank you for having me and for um, accommodating me in the agenda, because I actually am going to go meet with the Minister of Health from Guatemala after this to talk a lot actually about our investments in Guatemala to support migrant populations, so very timely. Um, I'm really pleased to be here, not just on behalf of USAID, but in um, just with the, the theme of this symposium, which really actually brings together a lot of my career, which has been really focused on investments in health and support to people in crisis. Um, and as you heard, I have a lot of focus in my professional background in, in the humanitarian space and have spent a lot of time as a practitioner and then as a policymaker and now get the luxury of being able to do a little bit of both. So um, at USAID, like many of you, we believe that every person in every country and at every stage of life deserves the access to high quality and affordable health services that meet not just their current, but their future needs. And as we live in a period of time where we see just tremendous fragility in a range of ways, we see that migration and displacement continue to impact the demands on health systems. Over the last few decades, we have seen in the global health space that global health programs, which have historically been termed development programs, increasingly are needed in contexts that are typically referred to as crisis settings. And what that really highlights is that whether it's conflict or climate um, impacts, disasters, political or economic crises, these are all shocks to systems. And so when we talk about health systems as a core system, we are talking about shocks to systems. And our goal at USAID is to support systems in their ability to withstand these shocks so that services, particularly those who are the most vulnerable and marginalized, can continue. 80% of USAID's missions are in fragile or conflict-affected settings. And what that means is when we talk about a development agenda in global health, we now have seen in the last few years, and what I think will stay course, is that development and humanitarian assistance are often hand in glove and closely paired, paired. And sometimes that line between health programs in the development space and health programs in the humanitarian space is have a very fine line. And our goal is to look not just at how to provide these emergency services as they're needed, but how we can strengthen core systems so that they can actually keep up with the scale of need and ultimately actually mitigate the scale of emergency assistance that might be required. And that for us is really centered in primary healthcare. It's about looking and look at what our partners, whether governments or civil society and uh, NGOs to ensure that health services can remain consistent and ensure the robust nature and the agility and flexibility of primary health care across all aspects of the system. As we've heard, uh, migration and displacement are, of course, at record high levels across the globe with no region unaffected. And those consequences, I think, have presented us with some very key lessons and guiding principles that guide our work at USAID. So I just want to make a few points. First, we cannot achieve health for all unless we consider the needs of migrants and other vulnerable and displaced populations faced with inequitable access and unequal health outcomes. Ensuring that health systems can support these populations means that ensuring health systems actually account for these populations, particularly systems that we know have repeated shocks to them. Displaced uh, populations and migrants, as we have discussed, often faced very serious barriers, including limits to access and affordability of care. But there are also several times where we see in governments restrictive laws, policies, and practices only fuel discrimination and these other barriers. We've also heard about the fact that uh, when we have a surges or increased numbers of migrant and displaced populations, host communities can often experience strain and struggle with their health system's ability to meet competing um, and increased needs and resources. Within our work at USAID, um, not just in the Global Health Bureau or ICIT, but across all aspects of the agency's programs, we have really looked to ensure that health services um, have an angle of reducing barriers and have this, this angle of not just meeting uh, immediate needs, but really looking at strengthening uh, the system in the long run. 
And through all of those investments, what we have seen is not just the need to harness tools such as innovation, um, using mobile uh, tools, mobile digital tools like smartphones or, or other types of tools that can help access populations, but to really have consistent and clear data. So I was so pleased to hear some other remarks on that today as that is what allows us to ensure that programs are actually designed to really meet the needs of the people that they're intended to serve. Second, as we continue to work and build strong health systems, which are of course rooted in community, we must also ensure that health systems are able to adapt to shocks and meet the continuing changes and needs of populations. And for example, in Haiti, one of the areas of work that we've had actually building off this last panel has been really looking at at how, um, and over several years, advancing an integrated primary health care system in crisis-affected parts of the country, which has allowed the way that PHC is delivered to adapt very specific to the specific communities that it's serving. And as we re reflect on different lessons, such as Haiti, but many other countries, it's also forced us to examine the very systems that actually make healthcare possible. Um, and this is really critical in our view to this concept of resilience, which is a word I know is, is thrown around quite a bit, but resilience for us is not just the ability to withstand shocks, it's the ability to adapt our current and future systems to meet the needs of populations before, during, and after emergencies, but also to meet the needs of people before they leave on their journey to where they're going and where they end up arriving. This means for us that to be a resilient health system, systems have to have flexibility and agility to adjust resources, to have wide and clear policies that focus and ensure that health ser services are not just available but uninterrupted. And oftentimes that means going a little bit beyond routine health services and ensuring that it's a one-stop shop for people as they are on the move. Uh, for example, in Ukraine, we did a lot of work with the Ministry of Health to build out telemedicine capacity because what we saw was not just surges of people moving in the last few years as the this phase of war has unfolded, but also the departure of thousands and thousands of highly trained health workers. And so what that meant was there was a real vacuum of human resource capacity physically present in the country. And we had to really look at ways we could work in support of the ministry to not just maintain services, but scale services given all of those strains. And that reflected in different ways, everything from telemedicine consultations in emergency rooms or trauma centers, operating procedures, but then oftentimes just for routine basic care, especially for elderly populations with chronic conditions. And that's just an example of how when we look at investments they can have real far reaching benefits, not just for people in need of basic health care or those who are deemed migrant and displaced populations, but really looking at the underhand capacity of the system itself. Um, and we've seen that those have dividends, particularly in situations that end up being protracted crises. Another example is our work in Colombia, where we see many people arriving particularly from Venezuela that do not have immediate access to primary health care and therefore turn to emergency care facilities for basic health systems or health services, excuse me. And this, of course, as, as also noted before, presents a strain not just on emergency services, but it is more costly and, effect, uh, and expensive, um, not just for those seeking services, but for the system. So a lot of our work in, in Colombia has been through both the Ministry of Health and NGOs Geos, looking at how to um, expand enrollment in national, the national health insurance system, but also working with the ministry and developing a 10-year plan that directly accounts for migrants to be included as part of the public um, health system. Third, we also need to focus investments on strengthening primary health care systems capable of providing a full or comprehensive range of health services. So this is sometimes what I call comprehensive PHC. It's going a bit beyond kind of what is typically considered in the basic package of health services and really having a lens to community care, uh, particularly because in most contexts where USAID and a lot of our partners work, 
the vast majority of health services are delivered to outside of facilities. And that is true too for those who uh, might be migrating in or displaced within a, their country or migrating through a country or a community is that they're usually not necessarily presenting to a, a, a traditional health uh, facility. Fourth, integrating displaced and migrant populations into host governments and host countries' health systems is complex, but it's of course essential. This is what will be the make or break between having a Band-Aid approach and having kind of an overarching approach that it enables systems to be able to support all aspects of their population. And it requires political will but it also requires a concerted level of uh, focus across government and communities, really with a few key areas, um, appropriate policymaking and implementation and communication of those policies, which we know is also really critical as how it's tied to how migrant and displaced populations are viewed, enabling access to services and making sure that they're tailored to meet the needs of populations, engagement with particularly vulnerable groups such as women and children or those of other gender identities, working closely with local institutions and partners and really coming in behind their leadership to ensure that strategies and approaches are best centered in the communities that they're serving. And then addressing both short-term and long-term financial needs, which I think arguably is one of the high, uh, hardest uh, problems to un unpack because it really requires governments beyond the Ministry of Health, often with a Ministry of Finance in securing and prioritizing domestic resources. And finally, the last point that I just want to make is that you cannot deliver health services to migrant and displaced populations or any part of a population without people. And I cannot make enough of a plea, it's a huge focus for us at USAID, that we need consistent, increased, and sustained investments in the global health workforce. You can't get services to people without people. We need to pay health workers, we need to invest in health workers, and we need to protect health workers. And in most communities that we're talking about, if there were no health workers, there would be no way to get health services. We have uh, several efforts that parallel both the development side of USAID and the humanitarian assistance side of USAID, really looking at that spectrum of need for health workers. Um, and I would lastly just note and reiterate our unwavering commitment, um, along with a lot of our partners in building and maintaining strong and resilient health systems centered, of course, in primary health care. And, and just echoing and underscoring a lot of what this I, I heard today, which is that it's not just about thinking of PHC, it's thinking of maternal care, newborn care, nutrition services, infectious disease services, because it really is a comprehensive look that is people-centered and community-centered. And we really appreciate the partnership um, with so many organizations. I see many people I know in this room because it does take all of us, international organizations, implementing NGOs, governments, um, and of course, host communities themselves to ensure that people get the, the fundamental services that they have the human right to. So thank you so much.